Hey everyone, it's Jesse from Bear Flower Farm. Guess what flower is making it back into the crop plan this year because we're giving it another shot. It's stock. Now, if you've been following me early in my journey, I'm now headed into year three of flower farming. Stock is the flower that got away from me. Now, I tried it in my first year. It's a tricky crop because it likes cool weather. And even though it's cool outside right now, it doesn't stay cool for very long. So I didn't get the greatest blooms. If anything, for a whole tray, I got nothing. So I made some mistakes. I learned from those mistakes. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about those mistakes as well as what I'm doing differently this year. As you can see, I'm outside. I don't have any structures in the form of high tunnels or low tunnels. Stock would really benefit from something like that. I just don't have that kind of infrastructure, nor do I realistically have the capability to baby stock in the form of covering and uncovering. So in the beginning stages, you might wanna cover, but I am actually not going to do that. The 10 day forecast looks pretty good and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail after. The second thing is that similar to most other types of crops, there are different types of stock. You've got multi-flowering stock and you've also got single stem stock, which is what we're going to be planting. now. If you somehow pinch or it arrives damaged if you're ordering plugs and that central node is uh, damaged you don't want to plant that because it's not going to send you a viable bloom now the variety that i am planting today is called vintage and it is supposed to be 55 percent ish double flowering so that's almost like half and half right i'm going to get some singles and i'm also going to get some doubles i think that there is a place for both florists and retail sales for your single stems obviously not as desirable as a double but you just charge a little bit less per stem and it's still a totally usable stem. Now the varieties of stock become a little bit more important when you start talking about timing. You've got like cats, which usually is the most early flowering type that's available out there. You've got iron. Vintage is supposed to act a little bit more like iron. You've got column. So I try to grow column from plugs the other year and got nothing out of it because of the mistakes that I made. So it's just some stuff to keep in mind before you order stock. The last thing to mention about stock is that I mentioned it loves cool weather. However, it is not freeze tolerant. So it is light frost tolerant but not freeze tolerant. So you don't want it to be dipping into like the mid and low twenties with cover. It might be able to survive something like the high twenties, but it also depends on how you started your stock. If you started your stock through winter sowing milk jugs, it's obviously going to be a lot more amendable to these kind of extreme temperatures because that's what it's used to. So with that all out of the way, let's get planting and start talking about the mistakes that I made the first time around. This is the tray that I got. It's from Farmer Bailey. So this is vintage brown. I chose this color specifically to be versatile in both retail and florist orders. Um, it's technically not brown. It's more like a rose color. It's really pretty. I'll put a photo up here. This one's from Johnny's, but you can see the plugs look really, really healthy. There's some yellowing of the leaves on the bottom, which I'm assuming might be due to lack of nitrogen fertilization. So that's also why I want to get them into the ground. But you can see for the most part, uh, they perked up. So when I got them, they were on the lower part of the box. So of course, some of the stems were a little bit bent, but just being out in the sun for a couple of days or outside with light, they've really straightened up. Now there are a couple where like, this is a really good example where you see how this is basically pinched. This will not produce a viable flower. So I would be thinning this one out like that. And that way it's not competing uh, in this plug because most of the plugs have at least two that are seated in per hole for purposes like this. And they're also accounting for the fact that you're gonna have a large percentage of singles in here. So they wanna maximize how many doubles you're going to get. Now let's talk about the first mistake I made in year one when I bought from plugs and put them into the ground. I got the timing down right in terms of when I should be ordering the plugs. Here in New Jersey, I think a sweet time to order plugs is sometime the late of March, early April. I had them to arrive during the first week of April. That timing was right. Now the problem is I didn't necessarily know what to look for in the weather forecast. And having looked back and reflected, there are two things you should be considering with the weather forecast. The first is your nighttime temperatures and that's the more obvious one so you want to make sure that your nighttime temperatures are not going to go below freezing this is particularly important for 
plugs that you get that were grown in the comfort of a greenhouse. Remember, a greenhouse is temperature controlled, which means that even though stock as a crop is frost tolerant, this particular stock is not because of where it was grown. So it's not at all used to having temperatures probably even in the 30s. So you wanna make sure that you're giving them time to either harden off outside slowly or that you are picking a time in the weather forecast where it's safe for them to go outside. The issue with trying to harden off something like this is that these guys are ready to go. You don't really have weeks to harden them off. I would say that you would need at least like a week and a half to slowly harden them in terms of getting them ready for the nighttime weather extremes. So your next best bet is either working with the weather to find an appropriate time or to cover for the first week. And this is really the only time where I will be covering to make sure that I am giving them a little bit more time to establish themselves. Now, the second thing to look out for in the weather forecast, which I did not consider in my first year is sun exposure. So again, these were hardened off for a few days, which really is not enough. This sun, or sorry, this wind is so strong that my, my, my camera is moving around. But so what you want to look out for is you want to see, do you have blaring sun, full sun exposure for that few days that you are planting them out? Or do you actually have some cloudy days? I have a mix. I have quite a few cloudy days coming up, which is really, really great because it means that I could potentially get away with not covering. Now, if you had full sun exposure, you want to make sure that you are not going to expose your stock to that full sun because it will actually burn from that intense exposure. Again, they are grown in a greenhouse, which is not the same as being out in full sun. And I think that that mistake last time cost me a lot because my stock got severe transplant shock. It set them back. It did not allow them to put on the adequate growth that they needed in the month of April. And then they caught up in May. And by then it was too late because it got too hot. So they were never able to flower. Mistake number two that I made the first year builds on top of the first mistake, which is the fact that because it got so hot so quickly, the stock never had a chance to bloom. I would have had a chance if, two, if I did one of two things. One, I either had shade cloth or two, I had been a little bit more strategic in how I planted them. So I'm opting for the second option here. And I'm going to talk about how I'm going to achieve that. One thing I'm going to be experimenting a lot this year is intercropping, but intercropping to give different types of crop a little bit more time in order to bloom. So this here is an example of a bed of lilies and anemones. The, these are actually perennialized lilies or lilies coming into their second flush. They had a first flush out in October and they naturally bloom this time of year. So they started poking out and before they started poking out, I had put anemone corms in here back in like December. Now these anemones are definitely on the younger side for where I am right now. I would have hoped that they would be putting out a few more buds at least. It is what it is, right? Now here's the thing, the lilies as they start growing higher and higher are going to provide shade to a crop that really does not love the sun. So right now everything's getting full sun, which is great because they need full sun. But in about a month when it starts getting really, really hot, the lilies are gonna help start shading out the anemone. And this is a form of intercropping that is natural, that provides the objectives that I'm trying to achieve with a crop like anemone and stock. The lily anemone thing happened a little bit out of luck. I wasn't planning for the timing to be so fortuitous because I thought the lilies would take a little bit longer, but it really gave me, or it really made me think about how could I apply this for stock? So let me show you one of the two places where I'm going to plant half the stock. This is the first bed where I plan on planting half of the stock. So you can see that I do have some lilies that are peeking through. So similar concept, I'm hoping that the lily shoots will eventually help shade out the stock. And you can see that there are more lily shoots peeking through. And so this is an in-ground bed, which even though there are uh, two by fours here, it's really technically in-ground. So I think that this would be a really good experiment for spot number one to see how the stock fare. This is the second place where the other half of the stock will grow. 
This here is second year sea holly that is already looking so good and so lush. It definitely did not look like this last year. So I'm super excited to see what kind of blooms I'm going to get. Now, sea holly, the leaves are not going to get super, super tall, but it will still provide some level of canopy. And of course, it's going to shoot up very long stems of the sea holly itself. Now, the thing that I'm trying to figure out here is just how much shade does the stock need? This is going to provide way less shade than something like the lily bed, where there is going to be a lot more shade because of the canopy. Now to throw another complex thing in here, I actually planted some rose lily bulbs in here. So there will be some more I guess canopy of shade coming like you can actually see the tip here peeking through with the rose lily so i'm going to try to be strategic in where i place the stock but my goal here is to really learn the amount of shade that is going to maximize my chances of success with the stock now i know that some of you might be saying to yourselves why do like why don't you just plant them all in one bed and put shade cloth on top and call it a day yeah, that's definitely an alternative. But one thing that I'm really trying to do is maximize the amount of space that I have in here and use nature to do the work that would normally be manual. So if I can fit two to three crops in a single bed and have all of them perform beautifully, then I certainly want that to happen. So doing a lot of experimenting with that this year, you'll definitely see how that goes. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet to keep up with those updates, but I'm gonna get planting. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but of course, because this is a product that is being shipped, you may get some that have their central part of the stem terminated. And in this case, I would not even put this plug in because it's not going to give me a bloom. So it goes out to the side. And this one over here is a cell or a plug that has been seeded with four seeds. One of them did not make it. So see how that one just fell off. So I'm gonna take care to carefully take this out. And now I'm left with three healthy ones. Now they're totally okay to grow together like this. I just take care to plant in a place that's not too crowded. So maybe like somewhere like over here, my shovel's over there, but now it has plenty of room for it to grow four distinct plants. I would say that typically whenever you get plugs that have more than one seed in there, they're not expecting you to self thin. Uh, typically these are plants that can do really well in company of other seedlings. So snapdragons are another one of them. One thing I do want to make sure that I talk about is when intercropping, it's always really important to consider the different types of root systems that you're putting into the same soil space. So you want to make sure that you're not having two similar types of root systems compete with each other. Stock has relatively shallow root systems compared to something like sea holly, which basically produces almost like this type of root slash tuber, I don't even know what it's called, but the point is that sea holly goes really, really deep into the ground, stock doesn't, so they're not competing for the same nutrients at the same level when it comes to the soil area that they have. So that's really important because if you have two things that are competing against each other with the same root system, neither of them are going to grow well. Now, if all of this goes well, I should be getting bloom sometime in I would say like mid to late June. So that's when I've seen other growers get stock planting out around this time. And from a days to maturity, that would also make sense too. But again, last time I didn't get anything. I got really fat leaves, but no blooms. Look at this. Another thing I think about when intercropping is watering needs. So you obviously don't wanna to put two things that have two very different watering needs together. Now, in this case, I clearly don't have any irrigation. I try to stick with things that don't need irrigation, which is gonna sound crazy for anyone who's like, she intends to be a real flower farmer. Yes, I do. I intend to do it with nature again. So I've gotten away for the last 
two years without putting in official irrigation like yeah of course I'll take the hose out and I'll do some watering if needed but we have well here if there's a drought I really don't want to be watering my flowers uh, because we obviously need it for drinking water purposes um, but that's why I plant things like sunflowers like these that are more drought, drought tolerant because they have such deep roots we have very good clay soil here that retains a lot of water so I really can get away without a ton of watering now the last thing that I also consider here is just what is going to stay permanently and what is not so in this particular bed I've got sea holly I've got now rose lilies and stock. The sea holly, if year two goes well, I will leave them in for year three and see how they do. The rose lilies will definitely be in for another year. Now there's not a lot of rose lilies. There's probably about 50 or so here in this entire bed, which is like not a lot at all, but I plan on getting um, a perennialized version out of them. So I'll be getting them around the same time every single year after the succession. The stock, however, will be one and done, and then they will be picked out after. So in that case, I have a bed that even though sea holly is gonna give me a longer bloom window, at the end of the day, I wanna make sure that I'm still maximizing this bed. So even if I'm just getting three crops in a two to three month time span, and I can't really turn this bed for stuff later on, that's still better than just getting like one crop out of this. Now, I think that after when I turn to stock, after when the bloom window is done for the sea holly and for the rose lilies, I'll probably be able to put something else in here that is going to be shallow rooted and still do well. Um, I might put something like a light cover crop. I put that in parentheses here or air quotes because I can't truly terminate it without terminating anything else, right? But at a certain point, I do need to give back to the soil for what it is taking out of. But I'm constantly thinking about what are things that can go well together root system watering wise and then just from like a space planning perspective I think that this is also why I love growing and not necessarily just growing flowers just growing anything I think that people who are looking for a manual a template of what to do are potentially missing a bigger picture or opportunity of the potential or the limitless possibilities out there. I love the fact that there is no one straight route that gets you to the end destination when it comes to growing. And I think that there are just so many things that have yet to be experimented with in order for us to figure out what, like, how do we best maximize our space and our time when it comes to growing. You know, I think a lot of this stuff might have been done by our ancestors. It was just never written down in a way that could be properly passed down. So after generations of people just not being in farming or growing, you lose this legacy knowledge, right? And it's really up to this next generation of people who are getting into growing to share these experiments and things that they're doing with the broader community to not only encourage them to also experiment but to obviously pass down these learnings because i think it's such a shame if you just plant one row of one crop especially in a space like this i don't have unlimited space and i think that you could potentially even increase yields if you are companion planting the right way this is how i got started in this i was growing vegetables i figured out that flowers obviously give certain vegetables a bumper crop because there's more pollination that is happening but then i thought to myself why isn't there a ton of intercropping in the flower world and i just realized that if people were doing it they were not publicly sharing it in a way that was easy to access or people just weren't doing it at all now if i'm being completely honest with you all one of the reasons why i feel like i have the ability to afford mistakes and have permission to experiment is because of you guys. You guys watching YouTube, I'm obviously monetized on YouTube. And then more importantly, my Patreon supporters who pay $5 a month to allow me to continue making content. But a part of that monetary contribution allows me to take risks like this, to experiment and then share with you all. So if you're interested in intercropping, again, I'm gonna be sharing a lot more of this stuff on video, but I already have an article on 
some earlier intercropping experiments that I did, including intercropping snapdragons with lilies and crates. There's an article on that. So definitely check out the Patreon if you're a subscriber. If you're not, it's $5 a month. It gives you access to gated content. Typically, they're articles that accompany YouTube videos like this, but it's really a way to support me in terms of making the content because the monetization on YouTube really is not enough to compensate the time that I put in to make the videos let alone take certain financial risks like buying plugs and taking the time to plant them and figuring out if some of this madness will actually work. All right, so I'm almost done over here. There's actually a lot of self-seeded sea holly that I'm taking out over here because sea holly gets so big with an extensive root system that you don't want them self-seeding like crazy everywhere. So again, this is like weed maintenance over here. And I'm going to leave about a third for the other area. I think it's really important for one to have multiple test groups. There's no control group over here. But um, if you have multiple test groups, then you can assess to see what good could potentially look like. Because you could get a decent crop, but you don't know if it could be better. And then you can have at least some sort of comparison by making sure you're tri trialing different ways of a certain intercropping experiment. So I'm gonna get to the end of this and then we're gonna switch over to the lily bed. I feel like this is a little bit harder to navigate because not all of the lily shoots have come up. So it's a little bit hard to tell where I can plant without damaging the lily bulbs, but I'm gonna do my best over here. So I think these are actually doubles that are coming out. I'm gonna try to plant in between some of these doubles over here. I would say for the most part, these plugs actually arrived really, really looking good without too much damage. Like I've had to throw a, maybe about five plugs total away, but most of them, if there's any damage, have more than one stock seeded in there. So more than makes up for the damage, like that one's gone. Still got two beautiful plugs in here, or two beautiful seedlings in uh, one plug. The other thing to take notice is the sun pattern for your yard or your growing space. So the sun rises from the left of me right now, goes over there. So that's afternoon sh sun shining here. I technically want morning sun on plants like stock. I don't want the hot afternoon sun beating on stock. So if I can get shelter in the form of shade facing this way, casting a shadow, that would be really opportune. Now, I don't think I'm gonna maximize that with this entire growing space over here, but I am actually gonna take care to plant more on this side, so that way it gets some of the morning sun. Just like little things that I think after growing for a couple of years that you think about that you never ever thought about in year one. And if you haven't thought about it yet, probably something for you to pay attention to as you're growing this season. I'm not gonna be netting my stock. It's probably more prudent to net, but I find that with the one that I grew last time, it honestly didn't get tall enough for me to need to net. And I don't anticipate this one getting super, super tall. Maybe my plan with the shading will work, but in that case, there will actually be natural support from the shade from wind, rain. So that's also why I don't think I necessarily need to net. Uh, I have netting. I hate netting because of harvesting reasons. So I try not to net if I don't have to. And I will plan like this to get away with netting. <laughs> I'm actually removing a lot of leaves that were put down in the fall and leaves just make it so easy to plant in the springtime because the soil is adequately warmed up. It's got nice healthy soil life underneath it because it was more insulated over the last few months and it's definitely a practice I'm going to continue doing. I think leaves have really change the game for how I farm, not just from providing nutrients in that perspective, but from making it easier for me to harvest tulips, to this cover that makes it easier for me to plant earlier in the spring. There's so many lily shoots.
and we're done. A couple of elephants in the room that I want to call out. If you're mechanized by any means, you're trying to be efficient at harvesting, this may not be the route to go because clearly we've got things scattered all over and it could be more difficult to harvest from that perspective. The second thing is that we know how real microclimates are within a single growing space. The microclimate here is going to be different than the microclimate in the lily bed back there, which means that I could potentially get blooms at different times. And that's why when I have an experiment, I'm trying to get at least a certain amount of stems in a test area so that if I do have blooms, I'm not just having like five stems, I'm having hopefully at least like three to four bunches of stems come to bloom so that way I can sell it. Just something to keep in mind because I sell wholesale and it's frustrating to just have like a couple of stems pop up here and there. Really what I should have done was I should have ordered two trays of stock, but lesson learned, I'll do that next time. I thought I had more seed than I had at home to start. I only had about 20 seed left, which is why I didn't even start my iron stock. But yeah, there you have it. It's right over there. I'll keep you guys updated. In the meantime, here are some other videos around stock that you might be interested in in case of you're growing it too.